Hello, I'm Hilary Hahn, and I am back with... Nico Muley. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Good to be back digitally, t together again over the airwaves. Yes, I interviewed you quite a while ago, so I thought I'd just check in with you and see what you've been up to lately. Uh, it's It's been crazy. I, I went to London for the summer last year and, and put together this big opera with hundreds of people running around um, called Two Boys, and that was an amazing, crazy experience. And then I got back to New York, and I'm putting together now a chamber opera with oh. seven people running around, um, which is equally amazing and crazy, but just with sort of, you know, <laughs> a tenth as many people. <laughs> Fewer hotel rooms and less driving for everyone less, involved. Less driving, and, and also, and also, kind of, you can you can actually see everyone at the same time, mm -hmm. which would with the big thing you couldn't. There was always this sense that it was like a family reunion in which there were cousins. <laughs> <laughs> well, when you write for that many people, does each person have a part you've written for them? Basically, yeah, and in a lot of cases, even even in the case of a of a big chorus thing, I try to make it so that um, there's controlled improvisation inside the chorus, so people can. You, you, you're given like three notes on which you can say any one of ten things, which I like because it means that you, you, instead of feeling like a big opera monolithic chorus, it feels like a bunch of chatter on the internet. Kind of, kind of like what we're doing now, times really. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it would be different every night too, not just different, it'll be different every night, city right? to city. It'll be the but... same length, but it'll, it'll have a different shimmer. Which have, is you, have you heard it produced more than in that production? No, that was the first production. It comes to New York in 2013, so we'll call, call me then. We'll both be ancient. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so you've been writing for a lot of people, and you've been writing for just very few people. Um, and, and, and in fact, and the, the, the fewest I've, I've written for was was for you. It was my my first really? solo solo slash duo thing in a while. Yeah. Oh, I didn't realize that. Yeah, so I, mean, I, I, you know, this, I I'd written a lot of solo string music like a couple years ago, but but since. For about three years, it's been pretty large. Um, so it was, fun, it was fun to get back to a, it was fun to get back to kind of sing, single voice against a piano drone kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Let's talk about that transition back. Was that um, informed by the larger stuff that you've been doing? Well, it, it always you know it's always good. I, I feel like it was a really good exercise also in remembering that you don't need everything in the, the you, you don't need the entire orchestra to make something kind of expressive. Um, and I mean, one of the things that's funny about the piece that I wrote for you is, as you saw, is that it can work just as a solo piece, or it can work with a, with a piano creating this kind of drone layer below. Right. Um, and it's is, still polyphonic, even right. with a solo. Thing. Even it's as a solo, exactly. Which is, you know, that, I mean, that's a trick that Bach was kind of genius at, where it's like, yes, he just keeps different registers active. And I thought it would be fun to keep two widely different registers. There's this one here, and there's this one way up here, kind of in, in a conversation with each other. Which I, Assume it's kind of hard to do, but but fun to fun to kind of keep active. It is. The piece is called Two Voices, and it is basically two voices. But I feel like there are sort of um, little subsections within those because it's not just here's the bottom voice and here's the top voice, and right. they're There's separate. And they can do anything it, in relation to each other at any time. Right. It and, feels like a real conversation where it's yeah. like sometimes they're in agreement, sometimes they're in disagreement, sometimes they're weirdly in the same place, and sometimes there's um, no totally. I was actually I, I just have a my little my little copy of it here, and I realized too that it it it's a it's a pretty austere piece. Mm -hmm. Like it, it, it has a very limited kind of harmonic palette, and a, but then there are a bunch of little surprises. So it's sort of like it's it's sort of like church music where and, and all of a sudden someone coughs really loud. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's true. Well. I actually have been wondering lately, like what the first kernel of of idea is for a piece, and in this case, um, where something has to trigger the first idea of what you're going to do. So where did that come from? You know, I actually, I I I'd, I'd seen you on on the, probably on some video online um, playing the the Earl Koenig, um yes. Solo. What is it? It's a fantasy. Is that how it's? It's the. It's, it's the Earl Kearney. It's the arrangement for solo arrangement violin for, by which, Ernst. That's right, and it's the most amazing thing in the world. And it's exactly this where you have to keep all these different voices active, plus the, plus this ostinato. And I thought, well, that's really interesting, because you know the, the violin can do so many things, but the idea that it's doing them all at the same time is so exciting. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I thought what would be fun to do is to write a piece that started with basically with two voices operating in, in, the, in a kind of almost religious, like all white notes space. And then over the course of, 
you know, two and a half minutes or whatever, it's, they get put under pressure, um, and then different things happen. Um, so really, really the way I started was with the, with the image of multiple voices coming out of the same instrument, um, kind of like a ventriloquist in a sense. Mm -hmm. um, and then, and then it kind of slowly, slowly developed into into the actual the actual piece as it stands. And you started with a solo version. I started with a solo version, but I always, you know, I, I wrote it against a drone, just thinking of, just thinking that it would eventually want to happen. But the weird thing about writing with drones is you, you can kind of, you, you, you can have them or you don't have to have them mm -hmm. in a weird way. It's a, it's like a... We should probably explain what a drone is. Well, a drone is just, a, it basically, it's just a sound that continues mm -hmm. um, constantly. And in, in some cases, they, they can be active drones. Like, for instance, um, like an extreme example would be like... A, a construction noise or something, or you know, in, in mo most people in their houses, you don't realize it until you your power goes out. But the like refrigerator, your refrigerator is a drone. Your what else? There's a bunch of there's a bunch of your computer is a drone. A hard drive. Is, there's all of these things that are on. I mean, if you've ever been in a power outage, it's an amazing moment after it stops because you realize there's always these subtle noises yes. surrounding us. Especially if you live in the city, it's crazy town. Oh yeah, it's I mean, <laughs> light snake noise and and. Um, and so, but then there are really active drones, like for instance, a vacuum cleaner is a drone that's, you know, it's not always doing the exact same thing, because depending on how much air it's receiving, it can change intensity. So I've always been interested in drones because they're so everywhere. And in, in the case of a solo piece, it feels like a solo piece plus drone for me emotionally always feels like there's, it's like you're going about your business in the presence of something constant and maybe menacing, but also reassuring. Do you find it grounding when you're writing? I do, yeah. Yeah, in a lot of cases, if I'm, if I'm at a loss about how to, how to construct a melodic line, I'll, I'll do it against a drone, which mm -hmm. I'll then remove. Um, I don't know, there's, some, there's, something very, there's something very soothing to me about it. Um, I mean, even when I, even when I was a kid, before I was a musician, really, I, I, could, I could listen to the vacuum cleaner all day. It made me so happy. <laughs> <laughs> it's like this really, this really, like, like, you could count on the vacuum cleaner, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> yeah. And um, in this particular case, I think it's interesting how you wrote it. It's just a repeating pattern, but it, it's rhythmic, but it's not. It, right. It, it's rhythmic. It, it, it feels like it's organized, but it's actually just cheating. <laughs> <laughs> or or it, is, it is organized, but it's like, it, there, it, it, it's, it's basically, I don't know what the word is, it's, it's like... Um, it's not cheating to write it, it's cheating in a way the the um, organization of rhythm as a player, I think. Right, and mm -hmm. it's, it's sort of written at rubato, but it's also this this sense of you, as, as as the player, you have to you have to figure out like how 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 hard you're going to imagine a grid of rhythm on top of it, mm -hmm. and you can do it. There's a bunch of ways that you can do it, which I think is fun. Like you could play it super like austere, or you could be really rhapsodic about it. Mm -hmm. Which is, you know, which is another funny thing about solo violin music. Like when you first see, especially Bach, actually, when you first hear Bach, I, I remember I heard it before I saw the score. And when you see the score for it, you're like, really? Like that's the rhythm? Like because it because people are, are so free with it, and especially with the with the partitas, you just think, you know, it's yeah, it's like <laughs> it's kind of a free for all. And I love I love that people are are, are bringing all this kind of expressiveness to bear on what, you know, or, or, I mean, as a pianist, like the, the perfect example is the way that the Goldberg Variations look, the score, the way they look, and it has nothing to do with how we interpret it now. Because mm -hmm. now it's like this, the, even the theme is this kind of long, unfurling, rhapsodic thing, but actually it's just this like dinky thing in 3-4, you know? So it's, that, and that's kind of what I was trying trying to do here, is something you could go either way. Yeah, I love that freedom. It's it's um, it allows you to use the moment a lot, just to kind of get lost in the way the performance is going. Or if you want to linger on something, you don't have to yeah, right. think, okay, well, this is exactly a sixteenth note, or this is tied over to an eighth note, so it has to be one and two and exactly. Um, and it's also, you know, as an encore, it's like it's always going to be in the in the presence of whatever it is that you've just played. Mm -hmm. So, so there's this idea that if it's, you know. If you've just come from something really exciting, that you can that you can you can play it like like a kind of nothing whisper. Or if you yes. come from something that, and you and you're like, you know, I love you, Atlanta. Like I'm gonna rock out. <laughs> you can you can do that too. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. 
No, it's great to play. So what are you working on after this chamber opera? What's next for you? Um, I'm writing a piece for the Seattle Symphony, which is, I'm closing in on being not done, but I'm closing in on being something like done. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so that's happening. And then I've got a cello concerto, um, which I'm really excited about for the Britain Symphonium, this young cellist called Ollie Coates. Um, and I have I have a really embarrassing, which I hope you can't see, pile of sketches for Can't it. see it. <laughs> um, what else am I doing? I, that's kind of it for now. Um, Is it just, one thing know, this, at a time for you? Are you taking it one one thing at a time, or a little bit? There's a little bit of multitasking, um, but there's also there's also this sense of of. Uh, you know, it's weird we, when you're a composer because deadlines, sometimes people are like, oh, okay, let's just say around the first of the year. But then enough people say around the first of the year that if I didn't multitask now, the last week in December, I'd be like, oh my God, I totally forgot about that crazy clarinet. You know, it's like... Yeah. So I'm trying to, I'm trying to be a responsible adult and like, do, you know, <laughs> do things in their own little... <laughs> but you, I may, maybe you don't have this because you're so disciplined, but do, do no, you ever forget I... that, you, that you said you would learn something? <laughs> When I have a deadline, it really brings everything into focus. Yes, exactly. I mean, there's something about the kind of, oh, it could be now or it could be later. Even if I'm really organized about it, there's still kind of a push around the deadline. So yeah. I just try to do as much as I can in advance so I don't get so panicked that I have a heart attack, for example. Okay. Just no, want to, you know, want to be able to sleep a little bit every night, even if there's a deadline coming up. Yeah. But what are you what are you learning now? What's what's uh, what's the new what's the next new thing you have to do? Well, I'm actually still in the process of premiering the first thirteen of these um, twenty seven encores, and that feels new, kind of in every single concert. It is, it is new. It's... Yeah, but each concert feels new, so it's an interesting time. Um, and your piece is in this this particular set that I'm. This round. Playing. Yeah. I have to. I, I have to. Uh, Think, figure out when uh, when our schedules are gonna are gonna align. I'm sure it's gonna be some yes. really we'll be in like in like Azerbaijan like next. Time. <laughs> it's gonna be so crazy. Yeah, like, I have where, to. Where, where do you go next? Well, I have to revive the Schoenberg Concerto because I'm playing that in in Europe coming up soon. So I love, I love revive like it's like it's a production for me. <laughs> <laughs> for me, I haven't played it for for a while, and I'm looking forward to it, but. It's a lot to, to juggle with this, and I'm also working on the Mendelssohn Concerto, and um, I'm looking forward to some interesting projects that I have coming up. So oh. for me, it's more, it's kind of like an engagement at a time, like, it's not like I have lots of big projects lined up, but for me, a record is a project, so I right. raised the Ives, so that, that's one Ives project, and then premiering these pieces is another project, but in the meantime, in between all of that, there are the weeks of the concertos and right. you know, all of this. So, are you doing um, are you doing Sibelius anytime in the next year? Or are you is that is that in bed for now? I would love to. At the at this particular moment, it is resting. But other okay. people are playing it, so I'm you know, it's nice when a piece is, is in the active repertoire, so that you know that when you're not playing it, other people are playing it, and it's is anyone, is anyone going to play Jen Hagen's piece besides you, or is that or do you still have that? Is that your your baby? No, other people are playing it. There's a, a guy who's been touring it, um, and he's a really the, good. That must be an amazing to like, commission something, and then then it has a life. I think it's partly dependent on the organ the or, the way the composer is organized, um, because Jennifer. When someone wants a score, she sends them a score and parts and everything that they need immediately. And right. it, you know, I think as a composer, you have to also facilitate the ease of performance, and that helps something to get played over and over again. But also, the people have to be interested. I mean, Jennifer has the Curtis connection. Um, the violinist is also connected through Curtis to Jennifer and so I think when you have a community of musicians that know your work right, and are already interested in playing it, when they see a piece pop up that's their instrument and fits into their performance They're like, you're programs, great. Exactly. So that's really what I want to see happen with all the pieces that I play that are new. I want other people to, to take them on but I do have them myself for a while so that I can get them out there as right. you know, with as broad a canvas as possible. Be as good a good as ambassador as you can, and then you can then you mm -hmm. can let it. <laughs> yeah, to really get the word out in, so that many people hear it and many people are aware of it, and then they can take it on. But it's funnier. I mean, this encore's project is so cool. If you look at it, it's just it's like a fun overview. It, it's like a bird's eye view of who's doing what where. Mm -hmm. It's it's kind of it, it would be funny to see everyone on a little map like. 
running, running their violin sick, but... Yeah, it would. And to think about all the different pieces that are being written by the people who composed for this project, the whole range of, of related pieces and premieres going on right now is... It's, it's, it's really astounding. Cool. It's it's really exciting. You can make so. a little. You can yeah, exactly. You could make one of those little like um, maps, like in the in the um, in in movies about what how, you know how, how people get a disease or something, where it's like one thing happens here and then it radiates out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, it, it all connects, and eventually it would come all the way back to probably one point if you if you narrowed it all down and and right, it would, be, together. Yeah, it would be like Charles Warren's apartment or something. It's like. <laughs> <laughs> Or, no, it would be like the Cinderella on, um, you know, 70 seconds. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I would be happy to be stuck in Cinderella for a while. That's yeah, a good exactly. Place. The Zabar's fish counter is actually the epicenter of all new music. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm sure someone would have fun with that one. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm sure there's a piece being written right now. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Called Epidemiologies, you know what I mean? <laughs> yes. All right, thank you so much. Thank you so much. I'll see you, I'll see you very soon. Okay, sounds good. Bye.